I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. We have uh, just uh, listened to a wonderful talk by John Bias on his favorite numbers, 8 and 24. Uh, those are some of my favorite numbers. And I'm with uh, Harris uh, Shekheris. Uh, we're sharing our first impressions of this talk. Uh, we'll, I think, return to it later with uh, even bigger party after more people have a chance to watch it. So uh, Harris is a philosopher, and you live in uh, Cyprus, is that correct? Yeah, I live in Cyprus. Okay, so welcome. So we can, the two of us can party. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too, yeah. And so what are your impressions of the talk? Um, uh, to be honest, it was a bit difficult for me. Uh, because... I I don't have the background. I have a bit of a background in physics, but not nowhere near the level required. So it was all a bit obscure to me. Um, even though it was fascinating when there was in place, or like for example, one thing that I uh, noticed again, sort of history is the sort of into play or how some mathematical tools were developed, which I thought had been developed for physics, mm -hmm. had actually been developed a way way earlier. So when the physicists maybe picked them up, um, even though I saw like or you know used them and then they became more significant. Mm -hmm. Um. There was a piece where well, I I regarded as sheer madness the Euler proof that if you add oh, uh, one yes. plus two plus three like the non-conversion series that I would I would love to I just couldn't see where the minus would come from so I was like what's mm -hmm. going on here this must be like Euler playing a trick on us or something I don't know uh, so we can talk about that. I can like I can pull up the slides it. and then we can talk about various things. Um, um to be honest, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe you can leave here because I was lost at many points. I mean, sure. even from early on, so I was. And I was hanging I, I in there, you know, like I was hanging in there, but I kind of I think I can understand a bit. And um, so why don't I pull up the slides? Oh, and so I'll open up. Um, but. He covered, I mean, I, we will certainly uh, encourage other people to listen to this talk because he covered so many topics that different people in uh, Math for Wisdom are interested in. So I had the chance to ask a question about uh, Kirby Erner's uh, favorite topic, which is quadres. It turns out like quadres are super important. Um, uh, so quadres are a coordinate system based on the tetrahedron. So a tetrahedron has, a, it's a pyramid, but it has a four vertices. It's like a triangle, and then you add a top to it, and you connect yeah. it all, and so you get, it's a beautifully symmetric uh, building block. And uh, so let's just uh, pull up uh, the slides. Okay. And so I think you can see that. And so um, let's just go to different. So he's talking about this 24 cell, which is a four dimensional creature. Mm -hmm. um, this is it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So this is a four dimensional creature. And um, he is, so if you look at the outer if you look at the outer uh, ring, there's uh, it's like an octagon. It's like a stop sign. So there's eight vertices. And if you think of, you know, each vertex on the outside has its opposite vertex. So there's four axes. Okay. Yeah. So if you think of those four axes, you can think of um, the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron is, uh, and so especially the way that uh, Kirby talks about it, he says, well, you know, consider the center of the tetrahedron as the origin. And uh, rather than look at 
three-dimensional space rather than look at it in terms of X, Y, Z. Why don't we look at it as having a ray uh, coming from the origin in each direction towards one of the vertices of the tetrahedron? So there's four vertices, so there'll be four rays, there'll be four vectors, so to speak. And you can de describe all of that space, um, all of space, you can de describe in terms of those four rays. Now, there's a couple of things to notice. Uh, one is that uh, because you're using these four rays, you don't need to use the negatives. You see, so normally when you have X, Y, Z, you have to use the positive, but you also have to use the negative. So you're actually using like six rays, a ray being like a half of a line, you know, a ray being that uh, like a vector, basically. So you're usually using uh, six of them. So, but if... Uh, you only need four. Now, however, because you have four vectors, but you only have three dimensions, what that means is that, you know, any vector you can write in terms of the other three, if you allow for plus and minus. Uh, so you get this repetition. You get this, uh, you know, like there's more than one way to describe a point, basically. So, for example, okay. if you add up all four vectors, you will get the origin, right? Okay. in a tetrahedron if you because they're all balanced so if they're all balanced if you add them all up you get the origin so there's two ways to write the origin you could say it's zero you could add them all up once you'd get the origin you could add them all up twice you'd get the origin you could add them all up three times you get the origin so there's many ways to write the same point that's not how it works in xyz xyz is more efficient in that way there's only a unique way to write a point with the quadrates there's four but the, what I'm trying to uh, draw attention to is that in this uh, very important thing, which is a 24 cell, which is actually like a something that typically would be imagined in four dimensions. It's a platonic shape, a platonic solid, but not in three dimensions, but in four dimensions. So it needs a, one way to think of it. It's like there's got these four axes. So like an octahedron has three axes. An octahedron would be like a, a square pyramid on top and a square pyramid on bottom. So if you take a square and you, a square is like basically two axes crisscrossed. And if you had a third axis, you would get two pyramids and you would have six points, okay, six vertices and three different axes and, you know, all combinations of those axes. And you, for each axis, you have to choose, you know, which point are you going to use? Because an axis will have points at either end. Now, instead of, uh, so that's an octahedron. Now a hyper octahedra, like he's talking about here, you're pushing it to the next dimension. So you're going to say, oh, let's have four axes, you see. And let's have four axes and you, you can look at points at either end. So now you're going to have four times two is eight points. But we don't think in four dimensions. So why don't we just flatten it all out in two dimensions? And so these outer vertices, there's eight of them. They're like the points on a hyperoctahedra. You see? So they're basically saying you got four axes and you got points on either side. But you see, that's what Kirby talks about. He says, why don't we have four quadres you see and so it's just it's just a hyperoctahedra saying take those four quadres for a tetrahedra but do them plus and minus so you'll have to multiply by two so now you'll get eight of them then there's another thing uh to notice um and i mentioned this in my question uh normally if you have a cube a cube has two times two times two it equals eight um vertices you know, because a cube, like there's a square on the bottom, there's a square on the top, that's eight. If, and what he mentioned, uh, what John Baez mentioned was like, if you take points on that cube that are alternating, so you don't take points that are next to each other, but you take points that are not next to each other, then the eight will divide up into four, and those four will form a tetrahedron. And so you'll basically have two tetrahedron, and they will fit together to get a cube. So you can take the vertices in a cube and you can break them down into two tetrahedra. Now, in four dimensions, you can do the same thing. So in four dimensions, a cube 
is called a hypercube, will have two times two times two times two equals 16 vertices. And if you take those 16 vertices, and if you um, divide them up into two sets of eight, which don't touch each other, you know, like you have vertices. So those eight will be these hyperoctahedra. So a cube is two hyperoctahedra. And then if you have another hyperoctahedra, you have three hyperoctahedra, and they form this 24 cell. So that's how you get this eight plus eight plus eight. So if you go back and you see how you constructed it, I can I can show here. This came from, uh, here he puts them together. Here is a 16. So this is uh, 16 vertices of the hypercube. And this is the hyperoctahedron. So here you actually see the quadres plus and minus that Kirby loves to talk about. Okay, so the plus would be the the the, the quadris. Now he's using these to talk about um, the quaternions. So the quaternions saying, let's have real numbers, but let's also add i j k, and i j k kind of like form a three cycle when you multiply it. So uh, you have a kind of like a um, vanilla. Like a, you have regular numbers, but then you have special numbers, and those special numbers form uh, their own uh, thing. Like i j k, like i times j will be k, j times k will be i, k times i will be j. They form this three cycle, and that three cycle has a life of its own, and uh, it's very much related to SU two, which is what we're excited to study. So, uh, if you SU two is basically the unit quaternions. Oh, so the unit quaternions would be the ones that are on the unit sphere, you see. So these, what he called Hurwitz integral quaternions, are a very special subgroup of the uh, unit sphere. And they're a subgroup where you have special coefficients. So you, can't, you don't just have any real number, but you have to have either like they're all in Z, they're all integers, or they're all one half. And then they lie on the unit sphere. So... Um, so eight of them will be the hyperoctahedron. And those are the ones where you don't use the number one half. So it'd be plus or minus one, plus or minus I, plus or minus J, plus or minus K. They just write down here. But if you look at the ones where you use this one half, then those are giving you uh, plus or minus one, plus or minus I, plus or minus J, plus or minus K. But then you have one half times that. So why is that uh, 60? Oh, because the... Let's go back here. This is eight. Hmm. I'm confused. Now, why would this be eight and why would this be 16? I'd have to think about that. Maybe there's an error here even. Hmm. Well, two times two times two times two is 16. And these, oh, do you know what? I think the deal is, is that plus or minus one. Hmm. I'm confused. So that's something to kind of try to sit down and think about. So anyways, but it all fits together into this. Here he fits them together. You get the 24 in here. So I don't know if that explained anything, but. Um, no, it's. Certainly a bit helpful, but I'm still, you know, this is way beyond my belief. Right. Maybe. So this is one thing that there's this highly symmetric thing, this highly symmetric platonic solid. Now, you mentioned this minus 1 over 24, right? Where does that come in? Um, here, right? So uh, No, not here. This uh, Euler's yeah. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Euler one. Yeah, so... And he gives a kind of explanation here. Um, how does this go? Okay. Let's see. Okay, so he has his derivation. The point being, uh, I mean, so maybe just to say, like, are you familiar with this power series or not? A bit. I mean, 
been a while, but a bit. Okay, yeah. so what the thing is, and so, you know, you have an infinite series, like one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, et cetera, et cetera. A very nice example, and, the, you know, you the question is, does this add up to anything or not, right? So um, a very nice example where it's clear that it adds up. Because, you know, if you, if x was 1, it just adds up to infinity. Like 1 plus 1 plus 1 squared plus, plus one, 1 cubed. Plus it's all infinity. Yeah. But I uh, have, have you ever watched the children's television show Sesame Street, which is an inspiration for me? Like, you didn't have that in Cyprus. Uh, no, no, no. Or I was either very little or no, I don't have any reference. So there's these two boys, uh, Ernie and Bert. They're puppets. And so Ernie is always, uh, Bert is kind of like the straight man and Ernie is kind of like the funny guy. But Ernie wants to have, they both have a cookie, right? So Ernie goes, oh, you know, you have a cookie, I have a cookie, right? And let's eat our cookies. And he goes, Ernie eats up his cookie very fast, you know. And he goes, oh, Bert, you have a cookie. I don't have a cookie, you see. You're my friend. Why don't you share your cookie and give me half, right? So Bert goes, well, that makes sense. So then Ernie gets half and he eats it up right away. He goes, hey, Bert, you have half a cookie, right? <laughs> You're my friend, yeah. right? I don't have any cookie. Yeah. Could you give me half of that half of a cookie? Okay, so one half times one half is a quarter, right? So then he eats it up. Hey, Bert, you have a quarter of a cookie. That's what's left over, right? So he eats it up. So the idea is that Bert never gets to eat his cookie. Uh, Ernie eats both cookies, right? Like so. But what it shows is there's an infinite series that one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth plus a 32, 32nd, it's all going to add up to two cookies, right? Mm. And so there's a general thing about this. So that's an example. Like if you, you can actually see how this works. One plus one half plus one half squared plus one half cubed. If you add it all up, you will get this mm -hmm. formula says what you should get. It's like one over one minus one half. Well, one minus one half is one half. And then one over a half is two. Oh, two. So you'll get two cookies. Now, but there's a nice way to see how to prove this, or at least to suggest how to prove this. If you multiply this infinite sequence by one minus x, right? What's going to happen? Mm. One minus x, the one will just keep the whole, you know, you multiply one by this whole thing, it'll just be the same, right? Mm. This doesn't change. But if you multiply this whole thing by minus x, what happens? It shifts it over, but makes it negative. So 1 times minus x will be minus x. x times minus x will be minus x squared. x squared times minus x will be minus x cubed. x to the cube minus minus, and minus x four. So you take that original series, you shift it over by minus x, and you add them up. Everything is going to cancel x and minus x will cancel, x squared minus x, x, everything will cancel except for the original one. There will be the original one left over. So that's this one on top. And then if you divide by y minus x, you get the one minus x on bottom. Because you had one minus yeah, okay, x times this whole thing so one, one x, and then just right, divide right. it on both sides. So that's the beginning of the story. Now it turns out that, well, okay, that will work so long as x is less than one half, it'll work. Okay, so like we did that for x equals one half, half a cookie will work, right? A third of a cookie will work. So if you do a third, it'll be one minus one third is two thirds. So flip it over, it'll be three halves. So one plus a third plus a ninth plus a 27th, add it all up, you'll get three halves. So this all works. Those are called convergent sequences. And you can, if you're very rigorous, you can prove that, you know, these sequences are, because they're just shrinking so fast, you know, one third, one ninth, one twenty seventh, it, it shrinks so fast, it won't, it won't have caused problems. But you can have what are called divergent series. So a famous divergent series is called the harmonic series. Like if you take the numbers one plus a half plus a third, plus a fourth, plus a fifth, plus a sixth. It turns out it's shrinking very slowly. And you can, it's not that hard to prove that you're going to get infinity, you see. Mm -hmm. So that's called divergent. It doesn't ever converge to an answer. It just kind of keeps moving off, keeps shifting. Mm -hmm. So when 
in the in the wild west days of calculus and limits and series people were messing around with this and sometimes they'd get sensible answers and then sometimes they'd get really crazy answers right mm -hmm. so it was unclear now there's a very rigorous way to do it where you have to be very controlled like you have to kind of keep tabs on the process so it doesn't blow up you know you have to kind of keep keep it within these bounds keep it within these realms so um that's just all theory. But you see, back in the Wild West, they would do things, and Euler was a you know a genius at this, like to get really weird answers. So I don't know how familiar you are with differentiation, but like if you differentiate, uh, yeah. yeah. So the formula is like x squared differentiated, you'll be two x. X cubed will be three x squared. So you can differentiate the whole thing here. One over one minus x. Well, one over x is going to be negative one over x squared. That's how it works. Like x to the minus one, which is one over x, you take the minus down, you get x to the minus two. But then you also have the one minus x side in here. So by the chain rule, you have to plug that in. And then derivative of negative x will give you a negative sign. So this becomes negative times negative is positive. Basically, you, you get this. So if you, if you believe that, okay, you get these formulas. See, now, even if we go back to this simple one, you see, it gives you problems if you say, like, well, what if x is 1? Then this all is infinity. You get 1 over 1 minus 1 is 1 over 0. You know, you're going to have problems. What if x okay. is 2? You're going to have crazy answers, like, you know, 1 plus 2 yeah, plus 4 plus yeah. 8 all adds up to 1 over 1 minus 2. Well, that's 1 over minus 1. That's negative 1. So you add up all these numbers and you get negative one, right? So that's considered, you know, that you went out of the bounds and you're getting nonsense answers. That's one way to think about it. But there's a thing. Um, so, you know, so once you start doing this, like, so he's putting in X equals negative one, right? That's going out of these bounds, right? Like, so one minus one plus one minus one, you know, is one over one minus negative one, that would be one minus negative one would be two, it would be one half, right? Yeah. But one plus, one minus one plus one minus one plus one. See, it's not sensible. Like, how do you add that up? There's no clear way to do it. You see, it's just problematic. So he's similarly doing this. He's saying, well, I'm going to get one minus two plus three minus four. I'm going to get one fourth. So first of all, he's going into this nonsense world. Then he's saying, okay, let's do the next slide here. And then he's doing this uh, Riemann zeta function. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but this is no, like, no. yeah, it's a, it's a little tricky. It's like one over one to the S, one over two to the S, one over three to the S. That's basically the harmonic series I was talking about, like one over one plus one over two plus one over three plus one over four. But what the S does is that you can do more versions. It could be one over one squared plus one over two, the whole thing squared plus one over three, the whole squared, one over four. You can study that and see what happens. And for the theories of prime numbers, it's very important because these become like the building blocks for primes and stuff. So he basically did more tricks with this. And then he goes down here. You know, he's basically, it's, you know, I won't go through. It gets more complicated and he gets this minus 12th, right? But he's off in this... Um, He's off in this nonsense land. Um, now, what's the, but he, but it turned out this minus 112 is very useful further on when he does calculations. But I want to say, what, why is this nonsense land not so necessarily um, unreasonable? Or what's the more modern way to kind of say it? The more modern way, and he talks about it here, let's see. He says here, this function can be analytically continued, you see. So when you have this kind of function here, this Riemann zeta function, and when you say that S is a big number, you know, bigger than one. So let's say like squared, like so one, squ you know, squared plus one half squared plus one cubed squared plus one fourth squared. Those numbers are growing smaller. And they're going to be controlled, and they're going to give you a number, which is pi over 6, I guess. So when it's controlled like that, like let's say this is bigger than 1, and you're working with the complex numbers, 
it turns out that a complex function, which that this is, if it's differentiable in certain ways, if it's if it's obedient, it becomes an analytic function. And an analytic function would be basically something that it can be written as an infinite series, like one plus something s plus something s squared plus something s cubed plus something s so forth. These analytic functions are so strict and so controlled of their own sake that they have beautifully constraining properties. And then that analytic function you can define outside this region, you see. So you switch from, you say, well, forget about this function. But in the, in the constrained region, it equals this very constrained infinite series. Are you familiar with like Taylor series? Oh, in, the name. Not really. Not really. So, well, the name a, 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 an again. example would be, let's say, have you seen the formula like e to the x equals 1 plus x plus x squared uh, uh, over 2 factorial plus x3 over 3 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial? Yeah. Vaguely from school. I mean, I was. I remember like one of the answers that we had in this series was at a e. Um, I don't know if it's one plus half plus third plus. Exactly. E or... So if you when x is one, you'll yeah. get e equals one plus a half. Plus, I mean one mm. one plus one plus one over two factorial plus one over three factorial plus mm. one over four factorial. So behind that, there's this more general formula: e to the x equals, uh, basically. 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x3 over mm. 3 factorial. And like there's that famous formula, e to the ix equals, uh, how does it go? e to the pi, i pi x equals negative 1, let's say, right? Like it's based on this whole thing. Like what if you plug in? So there's this beautiful formula, which is very strongly constrained, which says that, okay, e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared plus x. So what you do is instead of, 1 minus x, 1 to the minus s plus 2 to the minus, which is this wacky, crazy thing that's uh, uncontrolled. You say, you know, in the controlled region, in the complex numbers, we can rewrite this as a beautiful, controlled, analytic series. We'll rewrite it. Then that series, we can push to all these regions where uh, this other one was uncontrolled. So it's like the good twin. Like it's imagine it's like you have two twins. One twin is kind of maniacal. But the in at home, let's say, the maniacal one is well behaved. But you know, when when the maniacal one goes outside, they're doing crazy nonsense things. But they have an identical twin who's well behaved at home. But when that twin goes outside, they're doing very rational, beautiful things. You see. So that rational, beautiful one. When you go to negative one, you see they go, they're going to give this value negative one half. But so then what you say is, well, if that maniacal twin was well behaved, they would be giving you minus one half, you see. But actually, they're not giving you minus one half. They're giving you weird infinities, you see, because they're not, because they're maniacal. <laughs> but it goes, don't think about the maniacal thing. Think about the 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 good kid, you know, think about the the regular well behaved kid. So the well behaved kid would be negative one half. So it's kind of like if you switch the twin with their nice behaved twin, you would get minus one half. You kind of venture off into a different world. It's almost like you spiral up into a different version in a different universe where this thing is well behaved. The answer would be minus one twelfth. You see. So there's a modern way to kind of like restate the problem, um, you know, and so to put an equal sign there is kind of like not really fair. But on the other hand, like you can get away with a lot of calculations because they will make sense in the long run, let's say, sometimes in different situations. So uh, quantum physics, you're familiar, I think, maybe because you're a philosopher of physics, you're familiar with uh, renormalization problems, maybe. Is that... Uh, a bit, a bit, a bit. I was too low. So, Remember, I'm not a philosopher of physics. I did a course in philosophy of physics. Oh, okay. Like undergrad or something. So just to conclude, to say that, well, see, in physics, you I have this physics. problem. And that's something John Harland is interested in. Um, uh, so this just shows, like, you know, this talk touched on Kirby, his interest in quadres, my interest in bot periodicity, but even, like, John Harland's interest in renormalization, where... 
in quantum physics, um, you have this problem, like if you sum over energies. So like he was talking about like, well, all these partitions, you know, all this kind of like quantum harmonic oscillator, right? If you look at all these energies, you get into these situations where like if you add everything up, you would have to be um, adding up infinitely many possibilities. And if there's no limit on those possibilities, a lot of times for the energy, you're just going to get like infinite answers, you see, which are just kind of like, what do you do with them? Uh, they're kind of not really physical, though, because we live in a world because they're kind of presuming like, well, we live in a world where you have quantum states, you know, it's like state, ground state, first state, second state, third state, you know, they go up and up and up. Now, at a certain point, we get things that are unreal because uh, the energies get so large that they're never experienced. OK, so in reality, there should be some cutoff. But we don't know where that cutoff is, but there should be. But if you don't include the cutoff, you end up. It's kind of like this problem with the gambler, like, you know, if there's a gambler who uh, is betting double or nothing. You know, and if they they're playing against the house, they say, OK, I'm going to bet uh, one euro. And then if I lose, I lose. But if I win, I get two euros and I'm going to bet it again, you see, and then I'm going to bet it again. So if you look through all the possibilities, it kind of turns out that um, at each point they have a chance of, um, you know, winning this huge amount. And if you add up all the possibilities, like it's like uh, they're going to break the bank, you know, they're going to have a chance of making infinite amount of money. So you run into this case where no one ever plays forever, you see. Uh, and so the same thing, there's never going to get this like unlimited energies. So what this is That's doing, it's saying that, uh, well, if you kind of restate this in an alternate universe, you know, uh, that's nicely behaved, maybe like that has this self symmetry where things are kind of like repeating or coming back on itself. Right. Like, so that symmetry would somehow be related to this number 24. Then you won't get this type of uh, bad behavior where things become infinite. You'll get these nice answers that you really want. So this was kind of saying like that whole issue that somehow this is reforming, like, you know, refolding the universe in a way where things are nicer and you don't have this problem of things growing crazy. But uh, but like he said, it's not really clear like how this is working. Uh, so, but what it does seem to be related to, though, that kind of goes back to Buckminster Fuller, it does seem related to the fact that when you look at these ways of uh, kind of like trying to model the the universe with lattices, you're going to get two kinds of lattice. You're going to get square lattices, and you're going to get triangular lattices, or you'll get like cubic lattices, or you'll get tetrahedral lattices. And when you combine the two possibilities, you're not going to get something that could handle both possibilities will be very strict. You know, it's going to have to have a division by three, a division by four. It's going to have to have like 24 elements, basically. So somehow combining the cube and the tetrahedra is collapsing everything into this world that could have like 24 elements. Now, in the in the uh, wondrous wisdom that I work on, the mind is so tight that you get like, you know, eight possible divisions, which have six possible conceptions, which have like 12 ways of, you know, conceptions of the whole or 12 ways of picking out a particular perspective. Well, a cube has eight uh, vertices, a cube has six faces, a cube has 12 edges, an octahedron has six vertices, an octahedron has 12 edges, an octahedron has eight faces, you know, these things are highly symmetric. And so, um, and in four dimensions, like they're saying, you get this 24 cell, which has 24 faces or 24 elements. So you run up into very similar symmetries. So there's this super tight system somehow that's like at the core of mathematical thinking that just kind of like comes up in all these uh, different things. So that's the that's what the story is about. Any more comments on this? Hi, guys. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Antonio. Hi, how are you doing? So great. Uh, uh, I saw that you 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 talked to me, um, but I oh, and so we're I gonna have... be we're gonna be thrown out of here very quickly. I think in a few minutes. Uh, Harris, well, you okay, need to, so you'll need to leave. I'll, is that I'll right? Go. Yeah, yeah. 
I'll need to go out when we get shut off. I will go. And so I just yeah. want to thank you. Back. I want to thank you. Uh, um, and uh, Antonio, uh, could we reuse the link in ten minutes? Will you be around, Antonio, to talk? Hey, no, I will be. I will be here. Uh, actually, I, I'm working on some something different uh, for completing my thesis. But I, 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 I was uh, 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 a little bit far from this. Kind okay, of, so Antonio, uh, why don't we talk and let's let's give Harris the final word. I'm not quite clear how right. much time we have, and we'll rejoin. Um, Harris, what are your what are your thoughts, sir? Uh, thanks. This is really useful. I hope that it will pop up, and with friction to it, I will get more familiar and be more constructive in thing and be more immersed into this way of thinking. Okay. Um, I guess. I mean, so you, you know me. I'm a bit more like historical, sociological, like a different way of thinking. So. And I just want to thank you for um, and maybe thank God, you know, for this community we have. Thank you for watching this video. Would you like to join our community? Uh, go to mathforwisdom.com. You'll learn how to sign up for our email discussion group. You'll get invitations to our Zoom uh, sessions and uh, our study groups. And uh, thank you for liking this video, for subscribing this video and for supporting me and Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. I signed up with, with Patreon for Math for Wisdom, and it was easy and a good thing to do. I've gotten a lot of insight from the group. Uh, I'm learning new things. Patreon is a fantastic medium for contributing to anything like math or wisdom. Absolutely.